Well, listeners, we are going to continue our look now at films that are showing at this year's Monster Fest by taking a look at a great new documentary on musician Stuart Gray called I Should Have Been Dead Years Ago. And to find out a little bit more about this great doco, we've actually got the director of the doco, Jason Summers, on the phone right now. Welcome to the program, mate. Thanks, David. It's great to uh, be with you and your listeners. I appreciate it. Now, mate, this was an absolutely fantastic doco. I sat down and watched it yesterday, and I was enthralled from start to finish. I was wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about where this journey started for for you. What what made you want to make a doco on Stuart Gray? It started in the early 1990s in American college radio before the internet. Remember those days? Yes, yes. (laughs) (laughs) And so I worked at a really amazing radio station here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And there were bands like, you know, Royal Trucks. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yep. And, uh, and v- there's a band Vertical Slit that I got into at that time, um, a band from Cleveland, Ohio, doing kind of similar stuff to what Lubricated Goat was kind of doing, like really catchy stuff, but also kind of terrifyingly challenging stuff that was also confusing all at the same time and could shift gears and be just like totally uncategorizable, which was exciting for me. That's what I really was seeking out. And so then, uh, and I was in a band and in the music scene down here in North Carolina. And then I moved to New York and, um, I found a carved the Mars bar as a, was a very famous dive bar right near CBGB's right where, uh, I got an apartment and I found uh, the gothic letters from the co- you know from the cover of Lubricated Go Plays the Devil's Music carved into the bar, obviously with power tools that was about 18 inches long. And I knew then that for whatever reason, Stuart Gray, I didn't even know that was his last name at the time, might be in town. And then uh, a week later, I found a, a flyer on a telephone pole at our apartment and he was playing 150 feet from our apartment doing a performance. That's how I met him. And he was, when I then introduced myself, man, what an engaging, funny, uh, person, uh, to, with just a spark. And we became instant friends. Well, I think what I found so interesting about this doco was that I started out in radio about the same time as you, I was working at a high school radio station, um, at that time, and it was a radio station that, before our show started there, largely played pop music. Um, so they got a little bit of a shock when we started playing stuff like Dinosaur Jr. and, and stuff like that coming through. Um, but Stuart kind of has almost been a, f- a forgotten guy of the Australian music industry over here. It, it's been uh, interesting with the way that that's been. Do you think that uh, this doco will will kind of remind people of of his Australian heritage especially and and remind Australian music lovers of this forgotten gem that we seem to have forgotten about here? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And more than that, I think it's going to, I think it's going to ignite, it's going to ignite new interest in him. It's going to, people are going to get interested in the old stuff and then they're going to realize just how talented he still is and how much, cool stuff he's producing right now and there's so much stuff he hasn't even released yet that is amazingly epic music um so yeah i think it's the perfect time to come i think it's the perfect time for everybody to revisit the 90s and they're kind of hot right now anyway uh people are you know when i was in high school people were real excited about the 1960s you know um and uh but we're 30 we're 30 years away from the nineties, man, you know? And, uh, and so I think that he's the perfect person to revisit yeah. and to find new life in. That's what I think. And I think the, the, the film is proof of concept. Like if you come out of that film and you're not down with it, I find even people that aren't into that type of music, they appreciate the story. And if you're not into the movie, I don't know what to tell you as far as your taste, you know? Yeah. What, <laughs> what was Stuart's first reaction when you first started to talk to him and talk to him about making the film? I never talked to him about making the film. I just, there was, 
there was an opportunity to shoot an interview with him for um, a person who was doing a documentary about um, the live, or it wasn't live, excuse me, the nude performance on Blah Blah Blah, though it's very famous and like America was uh, like an ignition point for conservative talk radio and cultural wedge issues. And so I was doing a documentary about the band Dead Moon with my wife at that time. And this person from Australia uh, approached me because somehow he must have gotten in touch with Stuart and said, hey, do you know anybody that could do an interview with you? Um, uh, Because I'm doing a documentary about the blah, blah, blah. Uh, new performance of In the Raw. And so I I took that as a jumping off point and I already had a, a small camera and I started doing interviews with Stuart besides what I did for um, that project in trade for that person shooting stuff about Dead Moon in Australia for us. And that, that person, Craig Barnes, known as Cousin Creep, he then uh, has been a big supporter of the film and allowed me to use that footage, which I shot of Stuart. The initial footage uh, and some other interviews with him uh, I did of my own accord. And then I was traveling with the band and shooting them live at that time. So how did you find doing those interviews? Because I found watching them that Stuart is such a, a fascinating person and it felt like there was no topic that was that was off limits for him to talk about as well. I mean, he he talks about a couple of things there that uh, here in Australia seems to be widely known in the media, but nobody wants to talk about. Um, what was it like for you sitting down and doing those interviews with him? That's a great question that proves you're a good interviewer and a very attentive viewer because it was kind of, I could feel like my toes curling when I was doing it, I like, it was just kind of unbelievable to have somebody be that comfortable with you and talking to you. And I thought it was anomalous and it is. And yet he kept it up over the further, you know, the, the recent interviews that kind of are the bookends to the story. He was this, he's always been the same with me. It's, he's, he's an incredible person in that regard. And that's part of why the documentary is so compelling is because he's he's told me before and i found it fascinating he said i asked him about certain things and revealing certain things about himself and he said i'm not ashamed of anything i've ever done and i found that to be and i you know i i kind of believe him and he he's a person and you'll you'll see it from the mud honey guys and whatever he, he garners a lot of respect and respect is something that's not demanded respect is earned and everybody I know that deals with him, even though he can be ornery and an irascible rock on tour, all that stuff, he is very, what you see is what you get. And that's really uncommon, not just with, you know, musicians, celebrities, people who are well known or whatever, but just with anybody, you know? Yeah. So it, that made it fascinating. And then you add on the fact that he's a musical genius, not just composing, but performing and you know, concept wise and all that. And it's just like a total package, you know, it's like, how could you not? Yeah. I know documentary. This person's giving you access. Yeah. I know doing interviews like you've done here with Stuart and doing research like that, there's always that one bit of uh, information that you discover that completely surprises you. What was that one bit of information for you putting together this film that completely surprised you that you didn't know about previously? Well, I had no idea that he was <laughs> friends with N- Nick Cave. And, well, you know, Stu would, Stu would say, I wasn't friends with Nick Cave. He, he would qualify that. But he was friends with Kurt Cobain. He doesn't go around talking about that with people. Yeah. If people were to ask him, he would only be open about it. But he's not there sitting at, the, at his regular bar, like, crowing about that. I had no idea about that stuff. Yeah. You know? That was crazy to me. I was like, what? <laughs> you know? Because... He, he he doesn't like to do self promotion. Yeah, you know, shockingly, he he could benefit from it maybe, but he feels that his artwork. He says it right at the beginning of the film. His artwork should speak for itself, and people want to. Some people want to talk all kinds of garbage about him and whatever, and uh, and uh, he doesn't feel like he needs to puff himself up to be something more than he is, 
or to uh, strut around with what he's accomplished. And he's very self-deprecating, I yeah. find. And that's even more fascinating. Like, come on, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of never-seen-before be- never footage and, and photos, including the photo of Stuart with uh, Kurt and Courtney um, in this film. And Cat and Cat Beeland. Yeah. How did you go about... Uh, uh, finding all that was that was that stuff that Stuart had or did you have to do a deep dive how did you find all that that stuff's all readily available on the interwebs yep yeah so, yeah so, so so tell us a little bit about that tell us a little bit about all that um going out and, and finding all that stuff like uh yeah well the process of doing that was the hardest part of the movie like if If you look at the film, you look at the final scene, and then you see the credits, which are not normal, I did basically everything myself, because that's I've been in the film business for 30 years as a technician shooting, doing lighting, and I own all the gear and stuff like that. And so I was able to do all that myself. Um, But, uh, oh, man. I've lost my train of thought here. I'm sorry. Tell me the question one more time. That's all right. How did you go? How did you go about uh, finding all of that that footage and those photos yeah. and things like that? So, so even I'm sorry. Um, even though I sh- I did everything myself technically do- shooting the film, by far, by far the hardest part was the archival call- getting people to cough up archival stuff and getting in contact with people, especially in Australia. Um, and getting a lot of old school punk rockers who were a lot of times adamant to help, but needed cajoling, you know what I mean? And people coughed up a lot of stuff and it took them long time, periods of time. And I had to get people that weren't familiar with using printers and scanners to help me out and give, you know, and do proper legal clearances so that I could, you know, comfortably use the, the material in the film. And that was the hardest part of the film by far. Um, and I, ha- I have to say that I had a lot of really great people step up and help me out. And, uh, and there's, I still get stuff from people. People are now watching the movie and like, Oh my God, I have this, I have this footage or I have this poster or I have this photograph and they're still sending me stuff. So I have a huge archive, even of things you didn't see in the film now that are accumulating. I think I have more stuff in some regards about Stuart than he does himself. Wow. Wow. So this feels like this is the right place for monster fest is the right place for i should have been dead years ago to to get its aussie premiere so uh, how do you feel with the film um being at australia's largest uh, cult and genre film festival it's very kind to be invited by those crazy cats to uh to put us in that milieu and i think it's perfect i'm i'm thrilled to be involved with the horror fest um just because of the shock value of our film and the transgressive nature of it i think it is though it's it's somehow in the same same wavelength you know what i mean even though it's a different type of genre or whatever it uh, let me i do want to tell you it's not the australian premiere it has shown twice already and uh showed in perth and it showed in sydney okay. on film festival so this is uh, this will be you know Melbourne premiere and then it is going to another monster festival, um, the Murder City Carnival of Cinema in Adelaide, which is where Stu is really kind of from, yep. as you see in the film. And um, so I, I think it fits perfectly, and I think what better audience uh, crossover audience, and I think maybe people that are into horror would maybe be interested in checking this film out because it's included in that program, even if they aren't familiar with the music and that, that would be a good thing. You know what I mean? I think people that aren't familiar with him should check this film out because it's pretty, it gets your juices going, you know? Definitely. And for all of our listeners out there, we've got the, the times, the sessions, and also the ticket information for how you can see I Should Have Been Dead years ago at MonsterFest up on the subcultureentertainment.com website. And so I guess to finish off, Jason, what would you like to say to people out there who are about to head along and, and check out this film at MonsterFest? And also I've got to ask, what's the future for the film after all the festivals as well. Have you got any idea what you're going to do with the film after that? 
Um, I think the people that are going to see it, they should, uh, they should be, they should, they should get prepared. <laughs> they should, they should be, uh, they should be prepared to be, uh, unsettled and to be shaken up. And, uh, you know, some people f- find great glee in that, like I do. And other people, uh, have difficulty with that. And I feel like I'm doing my job if I'm making some people uncomfortable, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, as far as I, we did another film about the band dead moon and the films we do, even though we do them well, are so kind of weird that they have like a life of their own. And even though we are, we are adamantly trying to get people to see the film that wouldn't normally see it or whatever. No, it's like raising a child, no matter what you do, they're kind of their own thing. And the film will just kind of turn into its own thing and find its audience is what we've experienced being, you know, now, you know, it takes me about 20 years to make a film. We've done one every 20 years now. So that's, that's, and we hope, uh, we hope we hear from people. They, you know, we, we love to hear people's reactions to the film. If they hate it, if they love it. Um, and, uh, let us know if you like it and please, uh, they should tell their friends if they like it and, um, spread the good word. 